Welcome to the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. I'm your host today, Trainer Rhodes Ivy Audrain. <laughs> we have CEO Nate. How's it going? Good. I am so excited. Like the questions you have on this are amazing. I actually, this is the first time I've actually like written in things ahead of time in like a year. Oh so gosh. that's good. And Chad too, I have to say, so many people messaged me to tell me that you did a great job. Yeah. So you have huge fans out there and I was wrong. Accommodating. Yeah, I think, uh, cool. Now I'm even more nervous for my, <laughs> my chance in the future. And especially because Ivy's going to, I think she's going to nail it this oh, time. Thanks. <clears> yeah. No and head coach, head coach, Chad Timmerman is here. How's it going? Hey everybody. It's going well. How are you doing? Good. First time Good. hosting. This is big. We love John. We miss him, but. We can do this, right? We can do it. We can do it. Yeah. So Nate's Nate's excited about the questions. Last week, uh, I got super stressed out about hosting and was looking through some of the archives of the questions, and really wanted to make this episode my own. And so what I did is post on Instagram and asked folks to submit kind of hot take questions that they wanted our um, not really rapid fire responses to, but just some hot takes questions. And we'll also have a few regular listener questions. But really quickly, if you haven't been to our YouTube ch channel yet, we have a new race analysis, uh, Tulsa Tough Blue Dome Criterium, uh, with Zach, trigger warnings, crashing, trigger warning, criterium. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty intense. But yeah, go to our YouTube channel, check it out. It's great. Um, so first, I just want to do a little host check-in and see where you both are at with your fitness journey, training journey. What's going on? <coughs> Chad, go for it. Oh, okay. Um... Fitness is pretty good right now, actually, because I'm just riding a ton because I live in an, an awesome place with so many options and possibly many options. Uh, it's pretty untargeted. I'm not training for anything in particular, but I do want to be fit. It is summer and we do have a swimming pool. So the idea of taking off my shirt and not feeling just c completely disgusted with myself or, or, <laughs> or trying to, to hide in the deep end is uh, on on the menu. Um <laughs> I'm a little bit injured. I won't go into the the details of it because I'm always injured in some way and I'm figuring it because out. Because you don't want new... unsolicited <laughs> advice on the internet about how to treat it, your injury? That's absolutely part Sorry, of it just... for sure. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Sometimes I get some good referrals and some good advice, mm -hmm. but uh, this one has got me perplexed. And if I can't offer anything, I'm going to get it from all sides. And I think my FTP is probably hovering somewhere around 300 just based on what I'm seeing out there. And then uh, all I'm doing, uh, I've told you, there's basically a ceiling on how long I ride now. It's it's three hours. If it's over three hours, it means I got lost. I flatted. I something went <laughs> terribly wrong. Um, but I have found some roads that really lend themselves to r ridiculously good training. Just l undulating roads where I can do out and backs and uh, really drill it. And I've just started doing that and starting to realize all the long rides I've been doing are starting to pay off. And my shorter power is kind of coming up, which is super fun. And we just learned that there's a pretty good bike park not too far from here called Silver Mountain that has gotten some mm -hmm. really high praise. So I absolutely have to go check that out. Nice. Solid. How about you, Nate? Getting jacked. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> I'm weight training. Um, it's, you know, after Cape, Ab or Cape Epic, I had the third concussion. And I don't know if you guys have worked or see when I worked with me, but I like would forget lots of stuff all the time. And I knew it wasn't time to get back on uh, – the bike to hit my head again and have more, uh, you know, stuff on that. And then also, um, it's just fun to weight lift to weight train. So Chad, if you need some yes. tips on how to look good with your shirt off, <laughs> that's, that's what she's just, cause Chad's a strength coach. He knows way more than I do. And he was a strength coach before cycling coach. So, uh, just before anyone attacks me, like he, he knows what he's doing and he can make his body do whatever he wants. So yeah, um, lifting weights, super fun. I got a nice gym in my garage that Chad built. Cause it was I, literally in Chad's house, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> well, your the gym now. is like, <clears throat> Your gym is amazing, Chad. Uh, I added like one thing, but it's, mm. it's, it's, it can do everything there. So that is what I am doing. So if you see me and you, and I look, uh, oh, so at Leadville, I was 180 pounds. Now I'm 200 pounds wow. and I have lower body fat than I did at Leadville. So I've gained a lot of muscle. That's, That's interesting. Crazy. Our, our range is Dexa. totally the same. When I'm at the low end, I'm like 185. When I'm at the high end, I'm at 200. That's Wow. Except I'm like four inches taller than you or something, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. So you obviously carry more muscle than I do when you just in general, which I think is if you look at you is a true statement. Yeah. yeah. You're just like a that's slightly more stretched out version of me. <laughs> yeah. I'm like uh, Armstrong, whatever. The, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the, <laughs> stretch Armstrong. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Stretch Armstrong. And yet you too, all my calves have not grown ever in the history of life 
cycling for like 13 years in a row, calves don't grow. That's like a, that's an internet meme. Do you guys know that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Some people just like their calves don't grow. But now they I just are. just can't get them. So I do look like very, no, they're not. Oh. They look very, very stretched. And if I wear like long shorts and like my forearms are teeny too and, and like a baggy shirt, I look very, very skinny. <laughs> it's like that meme of the French bulldog standing up. With his <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, um, I guess my, my host check-in training a lot for another UCI cross season and here in Montana training, riding gravel roads, riding XC. It's been great. Um, how are you guys with motivation for what you're doing? Nate, do you, you like weight, weight, oh, weightlifting yeah. and yeah. I, I've never really had a, besides when I was depressed, which we'll talk about later, I've never had a, a mo- an issue with motivation working out or training because it's super duper fun. And usually I'll have like a goal and I'll obsess about it. And right now it's to get jacked. Yeah. And then come back to cycling. I probably is going to change my uh, like crit, or like a like, sprint critter or sprint critter, um, <laughs> criterium sprinter or criterium like 1K to go and get real, hmm. you know, anaerobic power or something on really flat, flat raises. Yeah. <laughs> that I mean, could be good if I'm heavy. Would be interested to see now with your new applied strength, like how it would translate in the cycling mm-hmm. fitness. Well, it's mostly upper body right now. Cause <laughs> at the beginning, I actually like, I skipped legs because you know, like I did legs for so long mm-hmm. and my upper body was atrophied. I was like, well, I better catch up. But then I kind of was like, oh crap, now it's tilted the wrong way. So give me like a few, six more months on legs and then I can okay. do some, uh, some anaerobic FTP, you know, anaerobic mm-hmm. workouts and FTP tests and stuff. Yeah. And Chad, you're motivated because riding in it's, Northern Washington is sick. <laughs> yeah, seriously. The terrain, I can't, I can't not ride outside. It's like, if I feel even somewhat up to the task, I, I at least have to go out. And as it works where I live, by the time I roll down to wherever I'm going to start, I'm already half hour out. So I'm on, already locked into an hour long ride. So they typically turn into two and three hour rides, whether I intend it or not. Yeah. That's great. Happy for you guys. Okay. <laughs> Let's get into some listener questions. Um, first one, how do you, this, well, I didn't even plan this. How do you tell the difference between a good <laughs> idea not to ride and just, and just being not motivated? What do you do when you're feeling a lack of motivation to train? I'll start. The, uh, <laughs> so the, the literature is trending more and more and it probably has been for quite some time, but it's, it's just making more and more sense that, we try to re- measure recovery in so many ways to give us like this uh, pass or fail. I mean, you're good to go. You're, you should probably take it easy today or you should skip the bike entirely. And, and there's just, I think there's a lot of confusion in the air. It needs to be simplified. And one of the simplest ways to do it and probably the ways that, one of the ways that's the most reliable across athletes is by looking at it from a subjective viewpoint. Just asking yourself, do I feel up to it today? Because uh, more times than not, especially as you become a more, uh, maybe not an, an accomplished rider, but a more consistent rider the, as the, as the months and years stack up, you get a sense of those days where, man, I got on the bike and I knew full well, I shouldn't have got on the bike as differentiated from those days where, uh, I didn't want to get on the bike, but I got on the bike and it felt great. And I think that's what torments us all because we can't tell what that's going to be until we're on the bike. Sometimes you can. So I think it's really about building your, your self-knowledge base. I've referred to it so many times. And, and for me, I, it's kind of like things that I don't want to do in general. I, I create endless distractions. I find 10 things to do on my way to grabbing my helmet and cleaning the salt off the strap sort of thing and, and doing things that actually move me toward riding. I find other things to distract me from that. And before you know it, the day's waning and I still haven't ridden. And, and I, I typically benefit from having not ridden. And I never really consciously made the decision. It just kind of uh, wormed its way out. Yeah. But you probably feel guilty at the, during that same time, right? Because you across the day, and then you procrastinate it. Yeah. yeah, and it's no good because you don't actually recover as much. Um, it it does attract. Later in a, yeah, right. Hmm. To, to be to be okay with not working out and resting is hard for a lot of us, right? Because we get super hard mm, addicted, or we think like all the work that we had will actually slide back. But honestly, the rest, like Chad said, will make you stronger, um, which is really hard for a lot of people to get. For including myself. Like including myself, what you said, Chad, I completely agree on. And we're going to actually try to measure this at trainer road. We have um, a project coming up that is going to ask riders before their workout, how motivated are you to train today? And at first it's not going to change anything inside of your workout. We just want to see 
what happened. So if there is there can ML pick up a correlation where your motivation, I mean, these are these are hypotheses that I'll have is like motivation goes down over time. And thus you're probably overtraining and you need extra rest. Maybe you need a recovery week slotted in with adaptive training. Um, highly motivated for a long time. Maybe you can handle more stress. Maybe you need harder workouts. Uh, there's probably going to be some kind of sweet spot in there with, uh, maybe at the end of a block being a little less motivated than at the beginning. That's okay. Like Chad said, there's so much life stress and so many other ways to, um, measure this. And we, we've, you know, we're looking at more of them, but this is one that we can collect some data on, look at it over all the athletes. And then because we have workout levels, we can tell what is prescribed and really like how much harder this workout is based on the previous workout and see if, okay, what is the rate that we think you should be doing this workout? And then if you change your, um, if you have a lower motivation, does it correlate some different way? Thus we could then learn stuff and adapt to training, change your, uh, change your calendar, your training plan. That's the idea on it. And I agree. I mean, if I am not motivated, uh, you know, there's that idea of getting on the bike for like 10 minutes and then going, I've never done that. And st maybe I've stopped like once or twice. I just do it, but I can definitely dig myself into a hole yeah. because I get on. I'm like, I don't want to waste. It. I just did all yep. this effort to get on. Especially if it's an outside ride and you've kitted up and you've made all the you know, major, major mm -hmm. potions and loaded up on your gels and gotten everything <laughs> aired up and all your, 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 uh, what's it called? Your, uh, I heard that the, the British folk refer to it today as something that uh, it's not a fanny pack. It's a the bag under your saddle. What's a clever name for that? Help me out. I don't know. I can't think of it, but uh, it'll it'll come to me. Saddle bag. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's not that. They they described it, and I thought, what are they? Oh, that's that's a clever little as, as usual with the with the British folk. But anyway, you get all those steps down the line. It's really hard to talk yourself out of heading back home ten minutes later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why, you know what, too, if I'm low motivated, what I will also do is if I want to ride, I'll switch to a 30 minute like Taku minus one, where it's very, very, very easy. And indoors, I can just kind of plop on. I don't need to make all these bottles. I can just get by with some water and I watch TV and that can be pretty relaxing. And I, I can kind of get that itch of like, OK, how did this feel? And the next day, I usually feel pretty good. And if I'm not motivated the next day, then I really need a day off. Mm. But that's a good in between. Um, you don't have to have a productive workout. Even uh, I would do an achievable workout sometimes too. If you're not completely motivated, instead of pushing those levels forward in your workout uh, levels, just do one that's like minus one. You, you're, it's amazing how good it can feel to do an achievable workout on a day where your motivation isn't peak. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Those days of really consistent lack of motivation too, really important to look at why you might be feeling that way. If it's just removing other distractions or tasks or chores and feeling like you're missing out on other aspects of life when you go train, that's one thing. But I know I would feel consistent streaks of lack of motivation when I wasn't eating enough. I was just tired um, and I just didn't feel like doing anything. And all I had to do was start eating more and I got way more excited about writing, you know. Right. Yeah. Is, I have that too with the – go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that's a really good point. Uh, I, I, uh, at times I catch myself and I recognize that my motivation is sapped for some reason. And man, probably more times than not, it is tied to nutrition. It's for whatever reason I've been doing stuff in the yard, stuff in the gym whatsoever. And I haven't compensated my nutrition or I haven't adjusted my nutrition accordingly. And then it starts to drag on everything else. And I think, oh, I'm just pooped. I don't have motivation. When in fact, probably just not eating enough for how much work I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when that happens too, you, you still have to change, skip the day. Mm. Um, for mm -hmm. me, I'll, I'll like wake up and with my kids, I'll, I'll, I might forget to eat breakfast. And sometimes I forget to eat lunch, especially if there's meetings, it'll be like three o'clock and I'll be like, wait, have I eaten today? And then you decide <laughs> and you can't get all the calories in and then you ride and you're like, I'm not, I'm pretty tired. Like Chad said, I'm unmotivated. Maybe I'm burnt out. Maybe I'm doing too much. It's like, no, just eat some food mm -hmm. during the day. And I know intermittent, intermittent fasting people will come at me, but like, I'm not doing that. So if it just jumps in there where I don't do it, it's hard for me to get enough calories in that window and then also train. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, let's move on. Next question. Should you push through DOMS to complete a workout or should you turn down the percentage of intensity? Uh, when is it DOMS and when are you just fatigued? Chad's talked about DOMS a lot on the podcast, but people still ask this question a lot. So I thought we should cover it again. Yeah, I think maybe an easy distinction to make between these two, and I say easy, and I'm definitely going to put that in quotes, is that uh, DOMS is is damage, whereas fatigue doesn't hurt. But I say that, and 
don't, uh, fatigue can hurt. I mean, you can be at a point where you're just bone tired and, and you did a hard ride, uh, a hard block, whatever, and your muscles are heavy and, and they kind of hurt. It's not necessarily muscle trauma, but it's maybe hard to distinguish that from actual muscle trauma. So if you can tease that out, discern between the two, it's important to recognize that DOMS requires healing. I mean, it is muscle trauma and that muscle trauma doesn't right itself if you're heaping on more stress, especially stress at the higher end of things. Might be able to get away with light activity, but there there is a ceiling to that. So, you know, if you think it's DOMS and you're still hopping on the bike for easy rides and the DOMS doesn't seem to be in retreat, well, it's probably time to take a day off or make those easy rides truly easy. And then on the fatigue side thing, that's that's where it gets very, very difficult to to decide. I mean, we just talked about it with the with the motivation issue, but it's a it is a wall that you can push back. I mean, DOMS kind of happens, and uh, I, I suppose you could worsen it, but fatigue you can just keep on pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing through it and, and dig yourself the hole we talk about. Whereas I think if you injured your muscles again and again and again, that would be a pretty short lived process. Uh, Chad, what are DOMS? Uh, it's delayed onset muscle soreness. So basically anytime you do something and then the next day and then typically 48 hours, so, so two days later, uh, it's just painful. And then those two days later, even more painful. But it's, uh, it, by all indications, it's actual, you know, micro trauma. So, so tearing or damage to the muscle. And again, that necessitates healing. And do you have to have DOMS in order to be to get faster? Absolutely not. And that's, yeah, I don't even think you have to have DOMS to achieve muscle growth. So it's typically associated with, with strength training or load bearing activity. So cycling is neither of which, um, I don't even think mountain biking may qualify. I mean, if you get really abusive on, on the, on a mountain bike, perhaps you could uh, achieve a, a level of DOMS. that would kind of amount to what you could get it or uh, face in the gym. But you don't have to damage the muscles to make the muscles grow. There are too many, there are other ways. There are, there are points to which you can push without pushing past and, and still achieve hypertrophy, achieve improvements in performance, achieve improvements in strength, endurance, all those things without ever delving into the world of DOMS. I had DOMS for about two years in a row. I remember like every this. time I'd flex my quads, I, they would what? hurt. And it was, I was doing too much all the time. And also then when I, one thing that actually helped a lot, it was um, increasing my, carbohydrate intake. I was, this was when I was, um, I first did high volume and I wasn't tracking my carbs and I was eating way less, probably like three grams per kilogram of body weight. And then I pushed it up to about six daily, like doubling it. And yeah, that reduced my DOMS a lot. And it probably makes sense is during the workout, I probably didn't double damage my muscles as much because I had the, the glycogen, um, there I'm thinking, is that, does that sound reasonable, Chad? Maybe. I do know there's a nutritional component. I mean, if it is healing muscle and you're not furnishing it with, and carbohydrate certainly matters, but protein as well. Either way, if your nutrition isn't on point, then you can't really expect your body to, to carve out those healing resources from thin air. I could have actually too just had too few calories because that's also when I lost like like 20 pounds or something of, uh, mm -hmm. of like fat and gained muscle at the same time. So being a caloric deficit and also uh, like training all the time, very, very hard. But I think for this, if, so I pushed through many workouts with Doms, especially in like a stage race, you know, that second day, your legs really hurt and you can still do everything. It's, it's, I think it's a fine balance. There are definitely times where you should just skip that workout or another time is you switch it to a um, endurance ride. Like you had 60 minute threshold, but your legs are just aching and you think you're not gonna be able to get through it. You could do that. But there's other times where I start with like dead legs after the warm up though. And during the warm up, you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> right. It's like, this is impossible. Then after the warm up and everything gets firing, you get through the workout and you're like, oh, that was actually wasn't that hard. Um, I think it's a little bit of um, trial and error. And I actually think on this one to test yourself and don't think that um, it has to be a certain way. And sometimes even depending on how long the intervals are, you have to get through the first interval or first set. And then you're good. Have you, have you both experienced that? It's kind of like with, with stage racing. And I imagine, Ivy, you have to race often back to back, right? Saturday and Sunday cross races. So you've got to be carrying. cross weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've got to be able to relate to that. So Saturday races and how they inflict themselves on Sunday races. Yeah. Horrible. And how much longer of a warm up I need on Sunday <laughs> uh, to kind of like shake it out. And yeah, what Nate is saying is totally right. You have to kind of play with it. And this is a great use for something like workout alternates the day after the after you have DOMS. If you want to 
test yourself and try it and try to push through, you can still alter your workout a little bit and pick something shorter or pick something with a different interval structure that might be a little bit shorter or longer, depending upon how you're feeling. And you can still target those same zones and get the work done that you need while you like shorten or change your workout. Um, yeah, I I've seen too, where, uh, what we just said, Ivy is like in the a warm up. I extend it like an extra 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you're like 15 minutes, easy spinning or even 20 sometimes if I have the time and then I get into it. And I found that really helps too. Is, is that the same case with you, Ivy? Yeah, totally. Especially with, um, like VO2 max workouts where you can have all different structures of short shorts or longer ones. And some of those VO2 max workouts, um, you can pick something that has more endurance or like a longer, either longer rest between work intervals or a much longer lead into the work. So you have a little more time to ease into it. Good use of workout alternates for sure. For sure. All right. Moving on. How do I maximize 30 minutes of training? VO2 max and sprints only. Does that help endurance? Good question. CrossFit. (laughs) (laughs) We have time crunch plans and train now athletes use both of these. Uh, Maxine will drop in the YouTube description. Uh, Sean wrote a great blog about training for time crunch athletes. And we have some great time crunch plans for 30 minutes and 45 minutes of workouts. But I know a lot of athletes use train now also exclusively for when they feel like they don't know when they'll have 30 minutes to train and they just want to be able to throw something in really quickly. Train now is a great use for that. Yeah. Ch- Chad, those, if you're, po- those you have plans third- actually go ahead. No, 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 you're fine. You go. I was going to pitch you. If you're if you're working out, if you only have 30 minutes, you can't just do zone two, right? Like, and expect to get, you know, do no. that for months and expect to get faster. Absolutely not. And that's why if you look at those uh, time crunch plans, I mean, they basically illustrate this very point. All of them are short, but they're they're short and sharp because you, you just have to consider the stimulus. I mean, what's what's likely to bring about any form of adaptation? It's probably not sitting on the bike and noodling for 30 minutes. Not if that's all you got and you can only do it a couple, couple three times a week. It's not going to do anything. It might burn a little butter, might, might help you feel a little better, enhance your circulation, clear some lymph, all those things that we get with lighter intensity rides. But lighter intensity rides have to be long if they're really going to bring about any real form of adaptation. So, you know, you, you have to push the intensity. And, and, and you can kind of look at it, too, about uh, – you can address it if you're trying to differentiate between do I want to do VO2 max work, anaerobic work, full-on sprint work. Then, you know, that, that first off affords you a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of options in there. But you can also ask yourself, you know, where am I weak and what do I want to achieve? Because you're going to get aerobic stimulus across all of those, especially the way most of those workouts are set up. Because even the very highly anaerobic looking ones are stacked closely enough that we're, again, pursuing aerobic adaptation. So you can say, do I need to improve my 30 second power? Because if I do, maybe I'm just going to do sprints this time. Do I need to improve my repeatability with high power bursts? Because I'm a four corner crit racer. Then I'm going to do 30, 30, 15, 15s, 15, 30s, whatever. So you can steer those. You don't just have to blindly take a short, intense workout and say, this is going to be the thing that I need. You can look at it and say, I need this specifically. So I'm going to, again, you know, look at workout alternates. I do understand that fat loss is probably off the table. And I don't mean you won't burn any fat because you certainly will, but 30 minutes at a time, a handful of times a week, isn't going to add up to a heck of a lot, especially if you're on the other side compensating with your diet, which a lot of people do. I worked out for 30 minutes, so that means I get a little extra gravy on my potatoes, whatever it may be. <laughs> you you have to you, you just have to recognize that it's not going to burn a ton of fat and it's really easy to put that fat back on. Best way to keep that fat off, take that fat off is going to be dietary. So 30 minutes regardless of how you go about it, high intensity, low intensity, probably not going to be a big fat loss impact. However, the conditioning is very much on the table. And, and as I just alluded to, across the formats, whether it's VO2 max, anaerobic, uh, slightly over threshold, sweet spot work, threshold work, all these things have aerobic leanings, whether you recognize it or not. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. All right. Best and worst recovery hacks. Hmm. I'll Nate. go first. Um, <laughs> okay, first one, sleep. Second one, carbs. These are best. Are, these are the best. Those right. are the two best. Uh, honorable mention, tart cherry juice. There's some science on that. And then actually, like, this sounds really bad. I, if you've listened to the podcast for a long time, I've tried <coughs> everything. <laughs> I like everything all at once, too. And, I mean, maybe there's some science for fish oil, too. But uh, I, 
I don't know of anything else where I really feel um, a change rather than carbs and sleep where I like that is what actually feels makes me recovered. And I bought every device I think there is um, to, to be recovered. And yeah. yeah. What, do, what do you what do you what do you think, Chad? Uh, you, you teed it up perfectly. Um, first off, there are no hacks. So anything that promises to hack fitness or hack recovery or hack sleep, just discount it, move on. Uh, I, I say rest and sleep, and I differentiate between the two because obviously sleep is, you know, when you're unconscious, whereas rest can be found in many different forms, conscious or otherwise. Um, so, but, but virtually the same thing, you know, recovery. And then the nutrition side of things, and you can wrap hydration into it. It does play an important component, but uh, nutrition in terms of the quality of your nutrition and the amount, especially relative to the amount of work you're doing. Mm. And then I, I see a need for mental and a kind of term it reconstruction. So you have to just remove yourself from that stress, find an, or just reposition your perspective, find, find something that takes you out of, we talk about the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic state, but takes you out of that sympathetic state on a very mental side of things so that you're feeling less stressed. You're cause I mean, all of us can relate to how wound up we get just thinking about a workout and, and a break from bracing yourself for each day's new workout and each day's new challenge on the bike is uh, something that is absolutely necessary. So recovery days do need to lean heavily on the mental side of things. And then uh, kind of honorable mention, since, since Nate did it, is self-care. And I, and I basically look at that as either mobility work or massage, whether that's self-massage or you're getting a massage. But in any case, something that addresses little hang-ups or pinches or forms of stiffness or, I mean, just movements that we don't normally uh, encounter on a bike or, or training for being on a bike. We have to move in these different planes, move in these different ways so that we're fully functional human beings. And then on the worst side of things, Nate, Nate kind of covered it. It's, it's most things you can buy. And the list is crazy long and it lacks scientific validation almost across the board. There are very few things that actually have scientific backing. Mm-hmm. And Chad, another thing that you mentioned that I should have said is when I eat nutrient dense foods, I recover so much better, mm-hmm. like, like kale and spinach and blueberries and, uh, all, you know, fruits and vegetables, pretty much you eat a ton of vegetables being probably the base, uh, and legumes. Mm-hmm. And then, um, the next one being, uh, fruit, you do those. And like, you, you, you have you both experienced that same thing. You, you eat the, um, I'm, I'm going to say air quotes healthy. That is healthy. You would healthy like that. Uh, and then you recover faster, Ivy. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm glad you said carbs and not just food because that's such a huge aspect of it for me is not just making sure that I eat enough, making sure you're eating the right stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. I feel like I it's could a- eat three pounds of like healthy quinoa salad and it doesn't, I feel like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> beep (laughs) this is the ivy show (laughs) uh too when you eat carbs you make another good point unless you're on the bike eating carbs wrapped in fiber is like the best way so vegetables Mm. wrapped in fiber fruit wrapped in fiber whole grains wrapped in fiber not so much um i don't know uh hard candy um like uh captain crunch um stuff like that the the things that naturally have fiber around it are usually um associated with better health in the uh, long run, which is what we all want too. But also I think you recover better too with all the micronutrients that are in these things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you could probably view it from the point of uh, nourishing the gut. I mean, just the fiber and, mm-hmm. and what it does for our gut. And obviously we, maybe not obviously, but often we don't link the gut to nutrition. And if we're not nourishing the gut, we're really not nourishing ourselves. Yeah. There's a lot of research with mental health and, uh, um, hormones in your body that are related to the gut and the, the bacteria in your gut, they, they eat fiber, right, Chad? And that's mm-hmm. the more fiber you eat, the more that they get to thrive and the better you are. That's like a very simplified version. The exciting part about gut um, microbiome research is it's like so completely complex mm. and there's so much to learn still. And we, I feel like it's almost like AI or space or something it where we, we just know a teeny bit. And the, the potential could be huge. It's a, it's a new and important frontier. And it's not super new. And it has been studied quite a bit. But I still don't think it gets the fanfare that it deserves. And I do think that's coming. I still uphold that we should make a train road cookbook. <laughs> or <laughs> see if Pete will come do special <laughs> cooking with Pete every once in a while or something. This, hey. is, this is great stuff. 
I know a chance. Uh, <laughs> the, the three of you are going to be together, what, this weekend? Yeah. yeah. Just yeah, take your can. phone out and whatever Pete eats, like uh, put on Instagram or something. Okay, that's like that's the, the basic. Oh, yeah, yeah. We yeah, can definitely do that. On, Ivy, what's your Instagram? Chad, you don't you don't go on Instagram. We can do that. Ivy will do it. Ivy's <laughs> on Instagram. So Ivy, what's your it's, what's your Instagram? It's at Ivy Audrain, and I will be posting what Pete eats. Great. It's funny. We, we have this plan for <laughs> yeah, everyone's coming up this weekend, and Pete's coming. So we're like, we should go to this restaurant. We should go to the, uh, we, any cooking plans that we make. Once we realize Pete's part of the picture, we kind of just shut them all down and realize we're going to go get a grocery <laughs> store, and then Pete's going to cook for all of us. <laughs> I'm excited. That'll be great. All right, moving on. That's good. <clears throat> Are there any disadvantages to overhydrating, or is there such a thing? <laughs> it's death. <laughs> That's the disadvantage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literal death, uh, hyponatremia. <laughs> what you do is you wash out. I'll, I'll pitch you a second, Chad. But it, you wash out all the electrolytes in your body, and your brain literally can't fire, and you die. And it seems like that could never happen, but man, it seems like every year somebody this happens to an athlete in a hot race. Um, I know like in Chicago marathon, a few years back when it was really hot, it was a very slow runners been out there for six, seven hours, I think. Um, and then they would drink water, 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 and they just flush their body out. If you're drinking sports drink, I don't know if this is possible. Um, and other than that, it's just the, I mean, you can add a ton of weight that you don't need. There's, there's definitely a, um, a point that you, at the end of a ride of being dehydrated, a certain amount, losing a certain amount of weight where you don't lose performance, but you, uh, also lose weight. And I, I had like a spreadsheet where before Cape Epic, I'd go mountain biking and I'd weigh myself before and after and yeah. all the amount of, uh, water I would do and try to figure out in this, um, at this temperature, how much water would I lose per hour drinking this? And then also try to account for glycogen because glycogen also for every gram of glycogen, you have two grams of water. So two to three. after a ride, what? Two, two to three. Two to three. Even yeah, more. A lot. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to lose some water for that naturally um, and, and be okay. And I think the rule of thumb, Chad, is it 5% of body weight? Like you don't want to go over that. You could play. With, I think it's a little individual too. So if you want to play with it, this is like the so easy to screw yourself by being too dehydrated. Mm -hmm. But it's also the, the fact that you don't need to end your workout at the same weight that you started. Like I don't think that's ever a goal um, yeah. for any cyclist. Man, there's a lot. There's a lot here. Um, first off, you don't. There, there's some of the best performances that have been achieved in marathon specifically, but across endurance sports have come at high, high levels of dehydration. And there's a there's a fair amount to unpack there too. It's its own topic. Uh, what Nate's describing is hyponatremia, though. So so hypo meaning low sodium blood levels. So if the sodium in your blood gets diluted, that can be catastrophic. It can have very serious consequences. So you can't just drink water without accommodating the electrolyte loss or balancing it with electrolyte electrolyte intake. So you can uh, – you say overhydration, and I think overhydration is – what Nate's describing. People associate overhydration with hyponatremia. And those two things create confusion because now there's so much buzz about being hyperhydrated. And there are, uh, you know, high, high sodium, 1500 milligram, uh, whether they're tablets or powders or whatever that you can, you know, ingest the night before, the morning of, across the event, et cetera. So that you do maintain high blood volume, so that you have a lot of fluid on board, but that comes with high levels of sodium too. So as long as you're balancing the fluid intake with the sodium intake, you can achieve what's called hyperhydration. So the opposite of low hydration, hyper high, not over necessarily, but high, but it has to be done through increased electrolyte intake. You can't just pound the water and expect to be ex extra hydrated. Yeah, and, and I think. Uh, no, go ahead. Oh. I think athletes ask this question because they worry about specifically having to stop and pee uh, mm -hmm. or, or like needing to pee during a race or an event. Um, and I know that it's not a bad thing, um, but I focus on hydrating too much and then neglect things like lowering bot core body temperature and then worry about mm -hmm. drinking too much and like having to pee and not look at the bigger picture and being like, why I just need to try to lower my core body temperature. Well, and that's that's one of the one of the benefits of it. I mean, it's in some ways akin to to carbohydrate loading. You're you're basically trying to stock that bank account prior to so that when you go into the event, you have a little advantage on. So so you can lose at the same rate, but you had more to lose. Or maybe you lose at a slower rate and you have this, you know, larger bank account to work with. But 
all of the consequences of being dehydrated and, and Nate, it's typically starts like 2%. I mean, a lot of the literature says at 2%, mm -hmm. there are measurable decreases in performance. And then when it gets to 4%, they're not twice as much, but it continues to decline. Some athletes can push it to nine or 10%, but these are the extremes. This is not anything anyone should pursue consciously. It just happens. They know the risks they're taking and, and, and if, for whatever reason in their narrow context, it works for them. But by, by maintaining our hydration, staying, you know, less than 2% ideally, but just trying to limit that dehydration. Yes. It's, it's, it's lower cardiovascular strain. I mean, it's more, it's less viscous blood. It's a heart that doesn't have to pump as hard or as often better thermal regulation, which is a huge concern with us as athletes, especially in these hotter times of year here in North America. Um, we just talked about it. I mean, better gut clearance. So not necessarily nourishing the gut, but keeping stuff moving through it, nutrients getting into the bloodstream, which, you know, is all part of improved di digestion, which we absolutely need if we're going to continue to, to compete. Chad, and we... Chad said this... Go ahead. Oh, oh I was going to say, Chad, we talked about a lot of core body temperature stuff in a previous episode. Can you just give a couple tips for athletes in, in regards to like hydration leading up to an event? so that you're not kind of catching up once you're riding. Yeah, and that, that's kind of what we're talking about here too, is understanding the interplay between sodium and sweat and also your particular losses. You know, are, are you a, a heavy sweater to begin with? Are you a salty sweater? Are you a heavy and salty sweater? Because all of those things are going to affect not only how much water you have to ingest, but how much sodium has to accompany it. So, and, and we talked about, it is what it is. It's a trial and error process because no two athletes are going to be identical. It just doesn't work that way, sadly. So you got to figure it out. And, and, and to make it even more complex, even tougher, conditions change. I mean, conditions can change within a race. They can certainly change leading up to a race and uh, across a season. I mean, there are just so many factors that have to be accommodated. But, you know, as long as you have a good idea of I'm, I'm a big sweater. So, you know, I mean, Nate, Nate sweats a ton, so he drinks a ton. And if he's going to drink a ton and he wants to maintain that fluid, you keep the fluid in the body, then he's going to have to accompany with it with some sodium. If you're not a heavy sweater or a, a, a heavy sodium, if you don't lose high amounts of sodium, then, then you're in a different boat. But you do have to at some point get a handle on what that is. So that when you head into a, an exceptionally hot day, you know, this is going to be tough. I'm really going to have to stay on top of my hydration. I'm probably going to pack an extra bottle in, in my back pocket, even though that's crazy uncomfortable. It's just a necessity today. I'm probably going to have to bring salt tablets because I know I hemorrhage a ton of sodium and this is a brutally hot day, et cetera. It's so much better to lose a little bit of weight or not as much weight as you would have, sorry, than be dehydrated where performance goes down and you cramp. And you can't finish the race and all the training is there, right? Mm -hmm. To try to optimize that thing. I know they talk about world tour pros of like, Hey, we set Chris Froome up at the, you know, at the start of this climb when he was winning so that he's like two pounds lighter. And this was the whole stage plan. Yeah. And you're like, I can do this too. And you do the <laughs> math. And then honestly, like, um, you don't have like a team of scientists behind you to do this. And I also think at this world tour stuff, when they talk about some of these optimization stuff, I think a lot of it is, uh, like psychological warfare against other people mm. where they say things that they don't do. And that's exactly what I would do. If I was having a team, I would say, we're doing this crazy thing, like something that sounds right, but could, you could really mess it up. Um, just to throw the other teams off, especially if you're dominant, right? Cause they're like, what is the thing that is making you so dominant and just put it on something that sounds correct. And everyone then starts to do it. And you're now even farther ahead than your competition. Well, I think Chad, you said, go ahead. No, ask your question. I I was just going to further the point. Um, no, further the point. Go ahead. I'm going to change that. Well, just the, the, the high-level teams with all those scientists and with the, you know, so many support members supporting each team member, they, they, they're kind of steering away from that even. They're not so concerned with optimizing body weight to that narrow margin as they are thoroughly nourishing the athletes. So it's like, it's like they're pushing toward the other side of things. They're recognizing we may get the nutrition a little wrong and the athlete may weigh a little more at the end of the stage or, you know, a week into a grand tour, but that's a risk that's better to take than, than getting it wrong on the other side. Yeah. One bad day in the tour is like, it can be really hard to come back. And so for all of us amateurs too, when you're training day after day after day, um, trying to optimize for too little is like just for that edge. Mm -hmm. It can have impacts on recovery. Well, that, that ride, you might be, you know, a pound less on that final climb, which is probably not going to make, you know, five second difference or something. But the next day he might be so dehydrated. 
um, that it impacts training. I notice that when I'm super dehydrated, I get these huge bags under my eyes. I normally have bags, but when I wake up, do you get that too? Where you're mm. super dehydrated, mm -hmm. you get giant <laughs> bags. And I think um, my body's trying to hold on to some like water or sodium, like everything it has. And the you know, rest of my skin is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. It is. I mean, that's actually. what being hungover is, is being dehydrated. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So drinking lots of water and not enough that I drink lots of water before I go, go to bed, but not enough that I have to get up in the middle of the night to pee is like the optimum level that I look beautiful when I wake up. <laughs> but Chad, you said something else. Very, very good. And you said oftentimes at these world performance, um, athletes are extremely dehydrated at the finish line, which is completely true. But I've also heard um, some other people say in other books about the most, the person who wins the race is often the most dehydrated. And that is a survivorship bias thing where mm. the people who are so dehydrated that they slow down, they're most likely stopping and drinking water then because they are like, they're out of the race, right? They've, they've blown up. And you don't then just finish the race still dehydrated. You start drinking some water and stuff. I so I, I would say that it's the most, let me finish this point. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's the person who finished, they could be, they finish the race dehydrated, but not enough to impact performance because mm. then they get the right combo of weight <clears throat> to speed. But that again, this world class, like if you're going yeah. for a two hour marathon, that's what you got to balance. Exactly. But for us, I mean, not a thing. And that's the point I was going to make. I mean, th these are athletes who who ha have a tremendous self-knowledge base, have crazy levels of experience, have been doing this for years, have been doing this at the highest level for years. And I don't think it's always an intended consequence. I just I think it's something that just happens in the moment. They're flying. They they know they need to hydrate, but for, wh for whatever reason, taking on fluid limits them. I, I, I'm not going to pretend I know all about marathon strategy, but I don't think they say I'm going to dehydrate 7% over the course of this marathon so that I get increasingly lighter and go a little bit faster. Rather, it's just a consequence of giving it everything they've got and prioritizing what matters most and recognizing I'm not dehydrated to the point where it's slowing me down. I don't need water right now. I've only got three more kilometers to go. I'm just going to gut it out, push through. I know I can do it at this pace, maybe even a little faster, but this is extremely high level. It's extremely marginal in, 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 the ter in terms of the gains. And these are athletes who know themselves inside and out. That's great. Solid advice. Thanks guys. All right. Next one. Welcome. <laughs> 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 I love this one. Uh, Zach says my hot take group rides are a waste of time. <laughs> Not a good or at least not the right workout 99% of the time and not good for learning race tactics, even though some people like to flex their egos. Better to train hard solo outdoors or indoors and use other avenues for socializing. Thoughts? <laughs> Chad, you, you want to take this? Uh, you go. You want me to do it? You go. Okay. Ivy, this is a, such a great question. So we have the upcoming workout levels V2, which is basically just scoring outside rides. And we, I was reviewing the, uh, so we're like data validation and I'll tell you why we, we want to do so much validation because I was looking at it and I was looking at some really hard races I've done, some really hard group rides. They felt really hard. I even got TSS, but the, tr the, the training impact, the amount of levels that I increased was very low. And you know, this is the same system for inside. And it is like thinking back at this and you probably all experienced this too. You you gain, you get faster when you train and then you can do like race weekends and you don't really get any faster. You kind of stay at the same level unless you're very, very new. If you're a very new athlete, like anything uh, does it. But I just, uh, we have to do more validation. I'm afraid people are going <laughs> to do these hard group rides and think that like their TSS might be high. So therefore they're going to be tired, but the training impact, like I was, there's one where I had, I know I went so hard and I think I scored like a level three tempo and like a level two <laughs> VO two max, but inside I was doing level six VO two max and uh, level five threshold. So much, mm. much higher than that. But if you, what we'd look at is, so if you do those scores outside, what can you do then on a workout afterwards? So mm -hmm. if you score a two and then inside you can only do a two or a three, that's one thing. Um, it is, uh, or if you score an eight outside and then you can't do a two inside, that would be another thing. We're looking at that, but it, people are going to be real upset when they find out that their favorite Saturday group ride, although it makes them tired and they get TSS, isn't pushing them forward as much hmm. as if they did two by 20 or <clears throat> some on off VO two max. And I think we all know this in our brains, but it is hard because those group rides feel so hard. Yeah. Um, it's just think about it as weight training. 
you could, if you just go into the gym and you just pick up weights and run around and like do whatever you want, you could get so tired, right? So quickly and pretty, probably get pretty sore. Um, but you don't, you're not going to get the same improvements as if you're doing like structured training, you're doing the reps in the right range, uh, you're working the, the right number of sets per muscle group, um, and you're being consistent over time. So I, I kind of agree on that. And I also find group rides a lot of times the ego, um, they can be dangerous, needlessly dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, especially with cars, man, the, the local group right here, they, I've seen people often blow through stop signs. Like you're in a group ride. Some people blow through stop signs and the, the turn is like kind of blind and then other people don't. And now there's a break and people do that. There's just a matter of time till like something horrible, horrible happens. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I do agree. Like let's socialize <coughs> afterwards and just go get coffee or something. Yeah. I, don't, what, I mean, Ivy, what do you think? I don't think that these race rides should be for socializing. So I wonder what kind of group ride Zach is talking mm. about, you know, like a big mass mm. Saturday chill, like long endurance ride. Mm. Maybe not. Maybe it's not great. Definitely not a great use for learning tactics, but, um, I mean, race rides, I think that they're super important. Someone like Keegan, shout out Keegan, does race rides at the end of his training and sees a ton of benefit. I know a lot of pro athletes that use race rides as part of their training to kind of sharpen the the soft skills that we can't sharpen when we're training alone. Great and I've thought it. a lot, yeah, I've thought a lot about the reason why some of these outside group rides or race rides, why the RPE feels so much higher than our individual training. And I think a lot of it has to do with the controllability aspect, going into a structured workout, knowing what to expect and feeling like we are in control and, um, yeah, having a really clear idea of what's going to happen versus on a race ride, feeling like you're a passenger and subject to whatever everyone else is doing and being on the defense and feeling like you're not in control of that structure and how much, how much rest you get and how intense it is, I feel like maybe that has to do with why the RPE feels so much higher for those race rides. Hmm. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I almost, I almost don't need to add anything because you just covered it. Both of you, between the two of you, it, it's all, it's all on the table now. But <laughs> <laughs> as you just stated, I, I think it's the same thing. Uh, we talked about it in a, in a previous question. You have to be clear on what you want from this. If you're going out there to work to, to simulate your VO2 max workout or your sweet spot ride. Good luck. This is not the place to do it. If you want to go out there because you want to throw yourself into a situation where you're not calling all the shots, where it isn't predictable, where you simply have to respond to it and, and make it work, where you want that, it's almost psychological prep for racing. It's not going to be all up to you unless you're clearly the strongest rider. And you know when does that happen? Or at least when does it happen consistently? So, you know, if you want race-like challenge, if you want a race simulation, these group rides can be great. And we're talking about uh, just kind of aggressive, brutal group rides. The, the, the one that Nate and I are describing, the local one, that's a race ride. If you're talking about socializing, then maybe this is a long, easy ride and people are picking up the pace and it's not that, it's not that long, slow distance ride it was supposed to be. But again, ask yourself what you want from it. And if you're not going to get it from a group ride, and that's a pretty tough thing to do because you're not in charge, then, uh, you know, stick it out, hop on the trainer or go ride by yourself. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Okay. Next one. What's the real reason people don't improve? You want to take this Ivy? Yeah, I do. I'm going first. Yeah, do yeah I Go do. Ahead. This is great because, uh, especially, uh, I get to look at all of our athletes outside workouts and look at if they're really doing <laughs> the kind of efforts that are assigned. Um, so I think the real reason <laughs> athletes don't improve is workout compliance. So as I mentioned, like doing the actual work assigned, uh, in a kind of smooth targeted way, consistency. So just riding, uh, you know, not front loading weekends and just doing really big volume on weekends and that's it. So riding, uh, even lower volume more often. And then finally, I think the ability to suffer, um, uh, to really understand how painful, uh, hard training is and lean into it and understand that it's not going to get better as you get faster. It's just part of it is something a lot of athletes miss. I think it's, uh, you, you nailed it, Ivy. Anything you want to improve in life, like mental, physical work, uh, school studying, it's the ability to stay un uncomfortable for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. 
And that is the key, like the most successful people in the world can do that. And it's so easy now with, uh, with phones to get that dopamine hit of when you are in something and you feel uncomfortable, the natural thing is to go away and check TikTok or Instagram for a second and what messages you have to get that little hit. And if you can be aware of that and stop that and stay in that discomfort, um, the feeling afterwards is such a bigger dopamine hit of going through that and achieving what you wanted to do, of getting through that, you know, that study session, that workout, uh, you know, doing that project at work. That's the, I hope all the trainer and employees are listening. That's the, like the <laughs> thing where you feel really good at the end. Um, and then if you don't, it can be, you can feel pretty guilty with those little distractions afterwards where you think that they're going to have relief, but they have no relief because they're not in line with your goal and the kind of person you want to be. Um, so that's, I think too, what the people don't improve. And the, the other side of this, all these people are like, Oh, I never skip a workout. This isn't me. You are the people who are addicted to working out and you can't sit with being uncomfortable, not working out. That feels too mm -hmm. uncomfortable. So you're like, I have to do something every single day. Preach. And Chad and I mm -hmm. both talked about this where I have an issue of not feeling, um, I can't sit with the thought of not being productive like just resting and having time to myself, I feel like I am air quotes, wasting my time and I'll feel guilty on that, that I have to do something productive. And I'm trying to get through that of like, just hanging out is okay. Sometimes, um, I don't have to do cause I have an endless amount of work. I have an endless amount of dad duties. Um, and it's important to be able to do that. And so there's another side of that, of being able to rest. It's not just gritting the whole time and we can get pretty type a and pretty, uh, crazy and burn ourselves out if we don't, realize that. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And then, and then it, it's an easy get and it's something you guys have already said, but I'm just going to echo it consistency. And, and honestly, I've, for, for whatever reason, I'm listening to so many different podcasts and so many different realms of sport, but uh, it's being phrased more frequently as persistence instead of consistency. And I kind of like it because it puts a more positive spin on it. It's a, uh, it's like I, I am choosing to persist rather than I am trying to maintain this dogmatic consistency that's pushed upon me. I don't know. It, it just kind of grants a level of ownership to it, which I like. But it's still the same thing. You have to do it consistently. You have to persist. You have to, from day to day, week to week, get the work in. If you don't, you're not going to get faster. It, it just doesn't work that way. And then the, this is going to sound like a pitch for Trainer Road, but you're either not doing enough Go or you're, doing, <laughs> you're, you're not doing enough or you're doing too much or you're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So again, it's the right workout at the right time every time. And, and, and that it, it's simple as can be, but it's super complex at the same time. So be consistent. And then uh, I guess we could reduce it to progression, but it's, it's far more complex than that. Sign up at TrainerRoad.com. <laughs> we'll, we'll take care of all the details for you. See you all next week. I was going to rehost. I'm, uh, I'm going to skip it because it's obviously much better than I can do. Thanks. No, all. no. You're going to um, eat food and talk and we'll listen, right? I don't know. That's your dream podcast? This is, pretty, this is a really good one, Ivy. So Thank you. Um, That's great. Let's just tank it the it's second half questions. and then you'll not have to do it the next time. I know. They're yeah, really shout, good out, shout out to our athletes for DMing me these questions, some of them we can't, we aren't going to do, but that's okay. Maybe someday. Um, and it is kind of beers of Chad for those of you that aren't joining us on YouTube. Yeah. It, Chad it and should I be are known. having a beer. It is one o'clock here. So this isn't the usual 8 a.m. <laughs> live podcast. We're pre-recording and this is acceptable because it's lunchtime. Right. And I've had three coffees, so I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty good. <laughs> Adderall with Nate and beers with Chad. And no, no. <laughs> no Adderall, just coffee today. <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. Moving on. Ooh, hot take question. Why gravel? Is it just being worse at cycle cross for 10 times as long? Plus is the spirit of gravel just less rad mountain biking? Discuss. <laughs> I feel like this is good for Ivy. This is, uh, this is Ivy's wheelhouse. I mean, um, <laughs> is gravel just being worse at cycle cross for 10 times as long? That is a hot take, but yeah, I agree. But Whoa. yeah, I mean, less less technical skills, yeah. so much longer, <clears throat> less steering. You don't have to get off your bike and carry it over anything. If it, you know, I we know that's not true. There are super muddy gravel races where people were running with their bikes in the mud. So 
Mm. Are you saying that's a plus to get off your bike and run with it? Is like something we should strive for? <sighs> um, yeah, I think it is. I think it makes you better. <laughs> we need to be challenged. It makes you a better person. I got gotcha. you. Better human. To, yeah. yeah. Makes you good to have to carry your bike. Um, I think the spirit of gravel is not less rad mountain biking. I think the spirit of gravel is um, inclusivity. Mm. Uh, you don't have to have a super high end. You don't have to be super competitive. You don't have to have super nice, fancy equipment. Um, these are all you kinds of, these are don't things have to about dress cycle a particular well. way. You don't have to dress a particular way. You don't have to have a ton of support or a ton of money. Um, it's very much a come as you are discipline. And that's why I think people are so into it. Do you agree, mm -hmm. Chad? Yeah, I said it at a few podcasts ago where it's just, it's less technical trail riding and more engaging road riding. It's, it's, it's a happy medium between those two things. You don't have to be a technical expert who's looking to bomb off drops or, or just, you know, ride gnarly trails. And you don't have to be someone who's relegating themselves to miles and miles of pan flat roads off into a dull ass horizon. It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> nice little marriage of the two. You get a little bit of trail, a little bit of road. You got a bike that's capable of going either of those places. So when you're on the road, it's pretty good. When you're on the trail, it's pretty good. You're not going to tackle again, gnarly trails and you're not going to ride long road stretches because you know, your, your bike's just slow, but it's a, it's kind of a, a Swiss army knife of bikes. You can do so many things on it. And if your terrain suits that, and I think this might be where the disconnect comes. I think some people might have to, they just don't have the availability that someone like, you know, I or Ivy living in Washington and Montana can, can, can expose themselves to quite easily. I, I don't have to go, I just literally roll out my door and I'm on either gravel or road right from the start. And it's, mm -hmm. it's brilliant. It's two. I think the people who are like, it's worse cyclocross or not as fun as mountain biking, those are the people that have amazing skills. There's a lot of us where those are like highly like dangerous and risky sports for us to do. And gravel, we get that kind of feeling. We get some technical challenge, but it's not like, you know, uh, mountain biking where it can darn like just not be fun in certain places, depending on where you live. Also the safety aspect, you go slower, mm. but the oh, big yes. one, no, no Less cars. traffic, less traffic. I was going to make yeah. that point hundred percent. Mm -hmm. that's a huge thing. Um, for me, I don't really want to do, there's a couple of safe road rides out here, but in general, we have great gravel in Reno and gravel is so like, Chad, we did a big, long gravel ride. We went on the road for like, was, I don't know, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to be on the gravel day. the whole time. And if a car does pass us, they go at like 10 miles per hour and they see us. They're yeah. not on their phones probably. And they're just going by and they wave, which is nice where other, yeah. <laughs> where other riders don't. And then the, the amount of adventure, of like being in a place that you've never been on a, in a car and on the road, that's very fun too. And you're out in nature and stuff, but, but without that, you know, mountain biking can the down and the up. It's very hard to be with, to stay with people at the same skill level either way, mm. but gravel, there's a little bit of drafting. I, I, it just, it's a more social one where you do those long rides. We talked about group rides, a group outdoor gravel ride. That's long a Z2 ride. There's no one who has ego and you just go and there's maybe some dissents and people do wait on those because it can be very scary. We had a question last week or two weeks ago about descending on a very slippery, um, off camber, gravel. Uh, off camber, right, right turn. And someone was like, just send it. Yeah. Don't do that. It, it, I don't know. The gravel is amazing. And I hope, um, I, I mean, it's obviously here to stay and don't knock it. It's, it's fun and it's not boring, not boring at all. No. You want you want boring? Go do a five hour road ride. I mean, there there are some places where a five hour <laughs> road ride. If you if you go to France, you go to Italy. I mean, you go to Vermont, whatever. I, I'm sure there are some places where that five hour road ride can be really entertaining, but uh, <laughs> most places don't have those. Mm. Yeah, it's that in gravel. There's especially if it's depending on how the road is. You make those little decisions the whole time, mm. so you're looking and you can't. You're engaged. Like, you're, you're following. You're engaged the whole time. Yep. And plus, if you're talking with someone, you can ride four across on a lot of gravel roads because there's absolutely no traffic. So everyone is kind of with each other. Um, you don't have to have your head on a swivel all the time because you're not seeing cars. It, it's great. We're pro gravel. Yeah, pro gravel. Pro total. gravel. All right. Uh, next one, pros and cons of an amateur doing big training rides with a world tour rider. Is this possible? <laughs> Yeesh. Like, um, <laughs> big training rides? Like maybe if those... I've definitely done a few longer days with world tour pro tour guys that are doing like endurance days. 
that are so long, but lower. Uh, and it just meant that my zone was quite a bit higher. And it sometimes also meant that I would have to only do part of the ride. Yeah. Uh, and then bail and they're like, I'm doing three more hours. And I'm like, yeesh, but, uh, definitely good. All these little things that I've picked up about training, nutrition, mentality, many of those came from mentors and sports psychs and other things, but a lot of it came from writing with people that are better than me. And it's hard to find <laughs> pro tour and world tour people that are willing to let you tag along. But if you can do it, you can learn a lot from them. And that was the only point I wanted to make is that's an opportunity to pick the brain of someone who's doing the thing that you want to be good at. And they're doing it at the highest level. They're doing it the best. That's just a invaluable resource. I mean, ride with them as long as you can pick their brain the whole time until they decide I can't talk to you anymore. You're too slow. <laughs> you're too obnoxious, whatever it may be. There's so much experience that, that they have that they can, I mean, just let them talk. You, you're going to learn so much good or bad. I mean, they, listen to their bad advice, listen to their good advice. There's just, there's no way to lose in an experience like that. I would write down the questions ahead of time and give it to them so they you don't have to speak during this ride. <laughs> uh, I mean, oftentimes these riders are three watts per kilo higher mm. than you are. That's That'd be very, like for the average rider and the average pro tour person, pro tour person. And you imagine, take your weight, multiply it by three and add that to your FTP. That's how fit you have to be to be with this person if you're around three to three, five watts per kilo. Like that is... That's insane to think about. I've done that math and I'm like almost a 500 watt FTP. That, I can hold that for what? Yeah. A minute, two minutes? Like not, not for an hour uh, with these riders. So it's really if they have to choose, they have to really like you um, and want to just ride at your pace. And we've done it, like we've done Sagan's Grand Fondo or uh, Dirt Fondo, Chad, and we had uh, Bora people there. Sagando, yeah. We had Bora people there and they were just messing around and riding easy. They talked to you for a while. Oh yeah. That's super fun. It was brilliant. I remember I, you, yeah. Well, I sat next you, to you, Maciej Bonar on on the wall on our on our you know probably the worst climb in our local road race, and you know of course I'm I wasn't huffing and puffing. No one was going hard, but I was working, and he's <laughs> breathing through his nose, just uh, accommodating me, chatting with me, yeah. and then uh, the oh go, go ahead, Nick. I said I was riding with Chad and. He made uh, one of the Bora writers, I forget which one, but everyone's there to see Sagan, and everyone knows Sagan. And Chad knows all of the names, right? For all the people down to, uh, you know, the, 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 the lowest writer who brings everyone bottles of the <laughs> domestique. Aww. And Chad's like, oh my God, are you this? And like fanboying over somebody. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> that, feels so good. That was Maché, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really got cool. to ask him how to say his name. So it was, it's Maché. It's not Massier, it's not Massé, it's Maché. That's great. Straight from yes. the horse's mouth. Yes, right of pros. All right. Nate will love this one. Is carbon fiber completely overrated? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> You're, What's HMM mean? Hmm. Mm. Like. Oh, just a capital. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Why uh, the hmm? You're a big uh, equipment I guy. Mean, uh, no. Like, it's amazing material. Uh, carbon fiber is the way. a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's not needed, but carbon fiber is an amazing, amazing material that is useful in a lot of applications. Um, in cycling, it's useful. Uh, the flexibility and compliance. Is it worth the money? That's a different question. Like, uh, you can do pretty well with an aluminum bike, but mm -hmm. a lot of times now it's, it's, it's cheaper and it's more durable and um, it's, it is beneficial. And if you really love the sport, you will have probably more enjoyment. It's hard to say, but you know what? It's enjoyable just to have carbon fiber stuff, even if it doesn't do anything, <laughs> just to have a fiber fiber carbon bottle cage when it is $40 more than a plastic one and it's five grams less. It's just mm -hmm. enjoyable to have that thing. Um, so yeah, that's what I think, but it's not needed at all. You can, I can get sm all those world tour people would smoke me on a, on a wooden bike. Uh, yeah. like a, one of those bamboo bikes, sure. much less a, uh, aluminum bike. They totally beat me too. Right. So chat, uh, Nate is not overrated but not needed, Chad. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's overrated at all. I think it is the material for bikes and I've ridden everything from just, uh, geez, steel bikes with chromoly lugs to, um, thin walled steel Reynolds 507, whatever it was. I can't even remember to titanium, titanium with carbon lugs, aluminum with carbon lugs, aluminum, everything o over the years. And it's all about carbon fiber these days, and rightly so. It's not, it's not trendy. It's just the highest performing material. 
Chad, I think when you get to become 60, that opinion switches to titanium bikes. <laughs> it might, you actually, because yeah. I rode titanium back in the day, and I did recognize the appeal in, a, in an older rider with a with a more accommodating geometry. Yeah, and the, the Cadillac smoothness, right? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And if it's, you just, you, it's wonderful yeah. material, and I've heard it described as whippy, and I never really found that out, but it was on a bike with uh, titanium tubes and carbon lugs, so maybe that impacted it somehow. I don't know. Cool. Good stuff. Can your bike setup actually make it harder to produce power? This one's easy. Of course. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes, in a million ways, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah. Saddle too high, saddle too, cl too short, your hip angle too tight, uh, you're uncomfortable, your neck stretched out too long. Mm -hmm. um, you're too, your hip angle's too high. Uh, your, I don't know, what's something else that could happen? Your saddle sideways, your saddle's tip too far forward, too far back. I mean, yes, all everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just do a, a time trial and, and do some arrow testing and find out just, just how much power you can lose if you're trying to get littler in the wind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. This one's going to be a hot take one and see Nate's notes. Uh, should they should they give out national champ jerseys to amateurs the same age as the pros, i.e. 19 to 24, 25 to 29? I have a little silly story before we get into this. <laughs> I did um, cyclocross, California state champ cyclocross, and uh, as a cat four, and I won the cat four <laughs> like race, and they gave me a state champion jersey. It was like a California state champ jersey for Cat 4 cyclocross, <laughs> which is blows my mind. It's the same kind of idea as this, but how could that happen where, you know, everybody in every other race would have smoked me, but uh, because I was Cat 4, I got state championship jersey. Wow. I never wore it outside. I was like, this is, I feel too dirty to, to do this. <laughs> what do you think, Chad? Uh, I think it's already granular enough. I think when they break it down more, it just kind of uh, dilutes the importance. Uh, and I'm not trying to take it away from people who may have done better if they were in a different age category because there was a real hitter that just can't be beaten in that five-year bracket. I understand where they're coming from, but, geez, there's enough podium presentations as it is. Do we really need to fragment that even more and have people hanging out even longer <laughs> for the post-race shenanigans? I, yeah. I, I, get, I just think a 10-year bracket is is sufficient. There's not a whole lot of fitness difference between a 31-year-old and a 39-year-old. Yes, it's there, but with endurance sports, honestly, I think you're probably veering toward friendlier territory at the, at the I, far, I, further end of that bracket. I, I don't think that's the question, Chad. I think it's like the people that are doing age group, the same age as pros between like – 20 to 30 oh should they have a national championship when they could have raced pros around that age oh that's a way better question yeah huh yeah. wait isn't it kind of u23 though but they're uh, they're saying i guess there are different be, interpretations there yeah okay yeah, yeah. We're, we're saying like let's say you're in your 20s and there's men racing in their 20s as the pros but you decide to race age group should you get the national championship mm. jersey when it's very similar well if you're you know 50 plus uh. that's different but if you're in that same age range and at the top, I have another question for y'all. This is a hot take. Is it okay? We've seen this pros, like maybe even world tour I pros, know where you're going. they drop, they drop down to age group, oh. clean up and <laughs> more swearing on the podcast. We have to change it. <laughs> and they start getting national championship jerseys for people who are, um, we've even seen it with some pros who like got caught doping and then they race age group and yeah. just clean. They kill everybody. Um, by age group, you mean like masters, uh, yeah. like 30, yeah, 30 like masters racing. Yeah, 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 exactly. 35 plus it happens yeah, yeah. in triathlon too. Mm -hmm. Um, they might take a Kona slot from somebody, uh, when they're, you know, 50 plus and the 50 year old who didn't race pro their whole life. Uh, it's very hard to beat those, those pros. Yeah. That's part of me wants to call it utter nonsense, but the other part of me says, well, they don't want to race professionally anymore, but they still want to race. So what are they supposed to do? So I, I understand the dilemma, but that is just it's just downright unfair. How are you supposed to compete against someone who's made a living of this and done it at such a high level for so long and gleaned all the benefits that come with being in that prestigious position? I say, especially things that are not mass start, let them race and just be like, tell the race director, hey, just don't put me in the results or mm. put me as like a, a different category, like a former pro category, something mm. like that. Um, that way they can achieve it. And this is the same thing I feel about like, 
70 year old people doing like hormone replacement in triathlon or any age doing that to put them in a different category. Like it is, it's, it's illegal to race that way, but let them do the triathlon by themselves and let them be in their own category and just to do the race and be healthy. And, um, I don't see any harm with that as long as they're not interfering with another race where people are going for it, you know, that aren't doing this sort of thing. And that's probably a really hot take, but yeah, I don't, I don't have any, I see any issue with that. All right. Hot takes Silence. with Nate Ivy Chan. <laughs> I've said that before on the podcast and no one came for me. So maybe this time there'll be a, a huge video. Nate, we're going to roast Nate you Pearson. so hard next week. <laughs> you have no idea. Buckle up. It's gonna... I'm not hosting. <laughs> I mean, you forget I'm CEO. I do what I want. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, this is really good. Uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Chad and I are obviously you color just, people. We're not hosting. just do it next week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, you should just do I think it. We've got our new host. All Until, of a sudden, you know, Jonathan's return and then we can. And then all of a sudden John starts taking steel cage time match. off and I got it host all the time. I see where this is going. Mm. <laughs> it's fun. Thanks for doing this with me. Okay. Next one. How do you deal with non-cycling daily stress? Yeesh. Nate Chad's has some good doing ones. it right now. <laughs> 1 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's that real. Can... That is real. I'm not recommending it, but uh, it does. It does help. Sure. Yeah. Nate, you want to take this one? Yeah, um, I would say I'm my best and then okay things. So the best ones I've just seen are like therapy, uh, time for yourself where you don't have to be productive. We talked about this before about really being able to like just have time for yourself and not feel guilty that, you know, I'm not with my partner. I'm not working. I'm not working out. I'm not with my kids. Um, definitely have guilt on all of those things. And then another one, I'm you know, I, I talked about this before, but having depression like medication has really helped me not have the the non daily stress. And that's of course something to talk to your doctor. And I was way like, I don't need this. I, I can just meditate my way through it and journal my way through it. And I was not able to do that. I tried everything. Um, and the ones that are okay, that do help, um, to do help on top of that are breathing. There's like box breathing and stuff like that. Um, just deep breaths can help meditation. Um, there's guided ones. Uh, I think there's an app called breathe, um, that is a really, really, I believe that's the one if someone please correct me in the chat, if I'm wrong, that helps with meditation, there's guided and non-guided meditation, uh, journaling is awesome. And there's another thing that I really like. It's called, uh, Nuvana. I've talked about this before, but it sends an electrical signal into your left ear as you listen to music and it like hits your, um, uh, I was like Vega Vegas. How do you say it? Um, the nerve. I always want to call it Vegas nerve, like the city Vegas, but That's it's it. not. That's it, V-A-G-U-S. Oh. It still said the same, though. Yeah, it's just spelled different, yeah. Um, yeah. And it it makes me feel like, I don't know if it's BS, but it it's supposed to calm it, but with electrical, with elect, hitting with electricity. But I do feel way calmer. When I get really stressed out, I put on headphones, listen to uh, Maggie Rogers, and like put that thing on, and I don't know, it's nice. So those are my ways of non-cycling stress, dealing with it. That's great. In an act of transparency, Ivy? I should say that I do not deal with non-cycling daily stress in a healthy <laughs> way. Um, oh. as a, yeah, this is what it is. I feel like um, my non-cycling daily stress has to do with the volume of things that I feel like I have to get done. And so there, it's much different from daily stress being like depression or... Um, you know, like a period of grief or anything like that. I have, to me, the non-cycling stress feels feels like it comes from feeling like I have so much to do. And my way of coping with it right now um, is uh, I let myself get stressed and be angry or anxious when I get on the bike. And um, I don't want to say it <clears throat> fuels my workouts, but that's never been the kind of rider or person that I am. Um, when people like outride their demons, that's super not like me. And I feel like that's what I've been doing over the past couple months, um, especially a away from my support system, like all the squid folks here in California and feeling like I don't have a ton of support and I just get on the bike super angry and anxious and try to work it out there. And it's okay because my workouts are like, I'm getting the work done and training is going really well, but I'm going to pay for it. So it's, it's problematic bike or exercise being your way to deal with your non-bike stress, not healthy long-term. Well, it can be, I mean, working out does reduce stress for sure. Um, 
But if you're if it's overwhelming and that doesn't do it all, there's probably more. I I, I mean I, I think a lot of people get stressed out. They go for a thirty minute run or they do an hour workout and they feel much much better afterwards. And that's okay to feel better afterwards. Yeah, it feels like a not, not a, good not long term way. fix for me. Like there's why a reason not? why all this why because there's it feels like there's a reason why things like this feel like it's too much and culminates and pushes me over the edge. And it feels like I should get to the root of that and why. And maybe it's maybe it's caffeine thing. Um, maybe I really am just asking too much of myself and I need to remove something, you know? Maybe I really just need to remove something. And instead, I just tell myself that training will make it better. And in reality, I'm like, whoops, haven't gone to the grocery store in a week. Uh, too stressed <laughs> out. Too much to do. Like, that's not healthy long term, you know? Yeah, but riding, yeah. riding the bike can help us tune out the nonsense. And, and if it is just nonsense and it helps you move past it, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, medicating by riding or via riding. It's... I mean, everyone picks their poison, right? And and getting on a bike is not the worst way to go. Uh, and then, you know, you guys, I, I think I, I, I know I have 10 years on Nate. And then Ivy, how old are you? 34. Okay, so I got 15, 16 years on you. <laughs> I feel like you guys are on the right path and you'll, you'll get there eventually. I mean, Nate is CEO of a company, so his trajectory is a little bit difficult in that, in that respect. But I, I've spent the last more than 10 years, but let's just pin it on the last 10 years, cultivating a lifestyle that takes me away from the nonsense and the stress and puts me in a place where it's not hard for me to find happiness or detach or just not detach and be completely present because where I'm at suits me so perfectly. And, and I know that's not the, the most widely applicable get. I know some people, it doesn't matter how, how hard they try to cultivate that lifestyle. There are other factors in play that won't allow them to do it or will make it very difficult to do it. So I'm not saying just do that, everyone. It's easy. It, it's not. But if you find yourself in that fortunate position and you can build a lifestyle around just moving away from the things that are stressful and toward the things that bring you joy, do that. So maybe maybe my coping mechanism is healthy. Is that what you're saying? For now. I don't think it's maybe. unhealthy at all. I think it's, <laughs> uh, it's transitory. It'll be something that gets you to something better as your understanding of yourself grows. Yeah. I don't think you should feel uh, guilty for getting relief from working out that's perfectly valid and yeah. that's like it's it's amazing actually i think that's it's one of the touted benefits all the time for working out is uh increased happiness like reduced stress you can see how i would do or people would do that right though especially when you feel like you have a lot that you're neglecting or just like a high volume of things that you want to do it's easy to feel yeah. like you're I'm, taking away from it yeah but i you know all the books i read about like high performance people in the world lots of them work out first thing in the morning because they say they can't, you know, they're overwhelmed all the time. They can't get through their day without the uh, hour workout or 90 minute workout in the morning. And that actually adds to their day and they get more stuff done, even though it takes time. And they would like, you know, uh, have problems and have burnout and uh, uh, mental issues if they didn't do it. So I, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I think you're in some of the best company in the world and you should feel like it's that productive thing we talked about, right? This isn't actively getting me groceries. So therefore it's not useful. Mm -hmm. Um, where reducing your stress and just like me doing nothing is useful for me and mm -hmm. I have to be okay with it. And it sounds like for you, Ivy, maybe working out, you feel guilty because you're not getting groceries, but maybe it is beneficial and accepting that makes it, uh, will make it even more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks for, thanks for the therapy, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Unlicensed therapy on uh, side of cycling coach. Well, Chad, what about you? What about for non-daily cycling stress? I have, what I said, I mean, it's a, I just don't encounter a lot of it. I, I'm good at avoiding it, stirring clear look of at it. him. <laughs> sounds blessed. like he needs a bigger... Chad, you're going to host next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I'm not. I, I recognized quite a long time ago that, it, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but I, I don't accommodate stress or I don't... Man, I use that word a lot today. I don't tolerate stress very well. I just I just don't. It, it uh, kind of wrecks me. And I think Ivy's coming up against this right now. I mean, we're, you, you learn about yourself over the years and you grow and you try to fix the things you can. And one of the things I've managed to fix quite well is moving myself away from stressful things. Mm -hmm. Growing and learning with trainer red. Growing and learning. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Let's move on. Just wait. We have another question, like two questions from now. It's going to take a big turn in the podcast. Can't wait. So stay okay. tuned. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Sean B writes, what are most people doing that is causing them to lose power? I come from a weightlifting background where they preach protein, protein, protein. 
Since moving over to cycling, I know that carbs are key to sustain energy on rides. I struggle finding the right types of foods to eat and proper portions of each food group, i.e. carbs, proteins, fats, and when you eat them, right before, night, sorry, night before, hours before a ride. Any advice on how to properly feed before and after rides? Um, oh, shoot, that one's from Matt L. Sorry. Why do us old people need more protein per kilogram? Is it gut efficiency, old man strength? Help me out. I know, I know Nate has a lot on this, so I'm going to try to be succinct. Uh, I think this is the crux of our our challenge as endurance athletes. We know we have to get, uh, the, the essential macronutrients, right? Fat is essential. Our bodies can't manufacture it. We have to ingest it. Same goes for protein. Same doesn't go for carbohydrates, but carbohydrates are what drive our, our actions. They're absolutely necessary if we're going to be a high level endurance athlete, especially a one with more glycolytic leanings. You know, if we need to burn sugar to do high intensity work, well, we got to ingest sugar at some point. So h- how do you, how do you balance all that? Because if, if you need a ton of carbo- carbohydrate, but you're also trying to fulfill a particular protein requirement or fat requirement, both of which you need, it means it's going to have to come at the expense of those two things. So it, it's just a tricky balance. It is what it is. Uh, w- w- when it comes to protein, I do believe in prioritizing a minimum level. I don't have as specific a recommendation with fat. I think it's a little more flexible, but don't quote me because I don't have full on information. I, I know there is a point something grams per kilo recommendation, but I, it, it doesn't spring to mind with protein. It does protein. It does. It's the, the, the U S RDA is 0.8, but that has been time and again, proven to be insufficient, especially when it comes to athletes in general, endurance athletes specifically it should probably be anywhere from 1.5 to two times that. So if you know your weight in kilograms, it should be somewhere in the 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilo. I mean, if you're not in that realm, you should probably do your best to get to that realm, especially if you're an aging athlete, and especially if you're just, or just in general, if you're someone who's trying to put the pieces in place now so that they're easier to maintain later, don't fix it later, fix it now and then stick with it. So once you know how much protein you need to get in, you know, sprinkle it with a little fat. And again, sorry, I can't be specific with those recommendations. And then the rest obviously has to be carbohydrate, which makes it really difficult to drink alcohol because that's another thing that kind of pushes into that. It it robs you of really valuable real estate, so to speak. So now if you're using some of your caloric intake, trying to maintain a particular body composition or even body weight, and now you're trying to balance four different macronutrients somehow and still get sufficient carbohydrate to do all the work that you're asking of your endurance body, it gets really, really tricky. Right. This is a... This is, I totally agree with you, Chad. And that was another mistake I've made over the years is focusing just on carbs and not the protein and just being like the protein will just handle itself. Mm -hmm. Um, I know for weight training, it's 1.8 to Mm 2.2 and you're right for endurance. It goes down a little bit, shifts down to 1.6 to 2.0, but you're like, Hey, that's almost the same as weight training. How could this be possible to take in the same amount of calories? Um, And this is because your workouts as a cyclist are so many more calories burning. Um, than weight training. And I, I agree with you, Chad. I've looked so many times. I, I've read it before about the minimum or like a good amount of fat for, um, you know, like get, get healthy fats. I want to say for my size at like 85 kilograms or 80 when I was racing uh, last year was like 60 grams of fat per day. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, so like um, 0.6, yeah. 0.8, I want to say. But again, yeah, I can't something recall. Like, yeah, yeah, so don't quote us on that. Something like that. And if I were to build it, I would do the fat and the Fat first, then the protein, and then everything else gets filled in carbs based on how much you work out. If you're working out three, four hours a day, obviously you're probably gonna be in that like six grams per kilogram of carbohydrate and you have the calories room to do that. If you're doing a 30 minute workout, you're not gonna be doing six grams of, um, six grams per kilogram of carbohydrate in there. And that's why there's no blanket approach to say every single day. And you're not gonna be able to eat that much too. It's crazy. Uh, a pro tip, this seems pretty easy to figure out, but it's so hard, like 60 grams of fat, it's hard to eat 60 grams of fat, to only eat 60 gram. It's easy to go mm. over. Yeah. They're like, man, you go to like a, like a fast food joint and get a hamburger, that could be 89 grams of fat in just that hamburger. Yeah, the fat, the, the fat in the meat, the cheese, the mayonnaise, you're there. You put avocado mm. on it, you're more than there. <laughs> if, if you're eating that like, you're making your own food, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and then you're adding your lean meats, use some peanut butter or olive oil or um, hummus and, you know, stuff like that. That's more manageable. Uh, but 
So the fat, easy to get. The protein, especially with how hungry I am, it can be hard to eat enough protein. Like that's a lot of protein, two grams per kilogram of body weight, especially for me. And a whey protein shake is amazing. I like the on nutrition one. And if you're vegan, you know, there's, there's great pea protein ones. You just have to have a little bit more to get the same, um, to get the same in there, which is perfectly fine. But you can, you can obviously build just as much muscle as a vegan as you can, uh, not a vegan. So I right, like right now I need to get lots of protein focusing on getting 2.2. I want to like optimize that. And I do whey protein shakes all the time and I can down them and I do like 50 gram protein shakes, drink it in about 60 seconds. And then I eat my other food around there. It doesn't fill me up too much. But um, if I ate that and on like chicken breast, I'd be really, really tired of chicken breast very quickly. Well, see, when it comes to protein too, and uh, to also address this question before we bypass it, do old people need more protein per kilogram? Anabolic resistance is a real thing. So that, that it, there is something going on. What the mechanism is, is <clears throat> topic for a full on deep dive and probably too we, We'd probably have to go too deep to make it actually relevant to being faster as a cyclist, but being more healthy as a human, as you age, your protein requirements do go up. Whatever those reasons may be, cast those aside and just recognize that you do need more protein and be encouraged by the fact that protein comes in way more from more resources than most of us recognize. It doesn't just have to be animal products or very clearly intentioned vegetable products that are protein sources. We get it from other places too. And that's not to say take it less importantly and don't at any point measure it and make sure you're reaching at least, you know, a gram per kilo. Absolutely do that. But th there have been times where I've not targeted protein intake and my body still adds muscle mass, which tells me I'm at least getting enough, maybe even a little bit of excess if I'm, if I'm getting bigger, which just opened my eyes to the fact that even though I'm not really focusing on my protein intake, there's obviously enough there. And because I don't have any overt increases in, in that, I'm not eating more chicken breasts. I'm not eating more red meat or fish or uh, whatever, name your protein resource. Uh, there, there has to be other areas that, and there are, because then you start to look into it and you start to recognize, oh, that, I mean, what is, what is gluten? All, the, all these gluten-free people, be aware that you are casting on, or ditching, casting aside a, a very viable protein source. That, that's, that's wheat protein. I mean, it, it, that's what it is. So just as an example, gluten, that, that's a protein. Yeah. It, Two, this is crazy. So oatmeal, for 100 grams of oatmeal, it's like 389 calories. It has 17 grams of protein in it hmm. and 66 grams of carbs. Like I, a lot of people don't think that. And there are, um, you know, essential, um, what do you call it, essential proteins. You need a mix of amino acids in order to build protein. So you have to have sources for different stuff. And this is something that vegans usually have to worry about is uh, having the right combo and even in certain meals to have, you know, their lentils and their beans so that they have the right um, amino acids mixed together. But in general, if you are not a vegan, you're going to get enough of that from the different foods you eat in mm -hmm. order to get the amino acids you can build it. So something like, again, like oatmeal in the morning, 17 grams. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Broccoli. Like you would think it would have zero. Yeah. Right? They all have. I can Google that too. How much look, does broccoli have? Yeah, look up broccoli. That was an eye-opener. That's a really good Broccoli point. has 2.5 grams for yeah. 31 calories. So six grams of carbs, but two and a half grams of protein. So it's almost half protein. That's really good. And then 2.4 grams of uh, fiber too. Yeah. Those are really good points, especially when thinking about the diversity of protein. And as an athlete that maybe doesn't want to do food calculators or calorie counting, counting that that's me. That's where I'm in. I, I am right now not wanting to Same. spend a ton of energy. Um, it's, it was kind of harmful for me in many ways to try to dissect how many grams and how much food I was eating in each area per day. And so what was much more successful for me was looking at those things that I regularly have in my routine for eating and like have an idea of how, what I was getting from each food to kind of generally apply some principles of what I should be eating. And the downside is, is I might overreach in some of those areas. I might overshoot sometimes, yeah. but it's better than the alternative for me, which was spending a ton of energy looking at weighing my food, how many grams of this, putting in a food yeah. calculator, you know, potentially getting back into disordered eating as a result of it. It was super harmful. So I might overreach, but the general principles are there. And overreaching too on protein intake with the whey protein shake, uh, like it's the, the amount of calories in this four calories per gram of protein being over, it's, I, I would not worry about it at all. It's and not a huge penalty. Eat, 
right? And it's probably going to be amazing if you do hit that like 2.0 hmm. about the amount of like more muscle you will build and how much better you will feel, um, especially as you're an older athlete too. Just having enough protein in your diet on those days. If you're in a caloric deficit and you have more protein in your diet, you will lose fat instead of protein, which is crazy to think that if you don't have enough protein, this is, this is right, Chad, right? If you don't have enough protein and you're in a caloric deficit, you're going to lose muscle, which is the opposite of what you want. And I think we see a lot of people with yo-yo dieting because their basal metabolic rate then lowers and the, the whole amount of calories that they burn per day goes down and then they gain the weight back, but it's like fat and not muscle. And it's just this cycle. Um, uh, right here, black beans. One cup of black beans, 172 grams, 15 grams of protein, right? That's that again. So you have some oatmeal and some black beans. If you're Together. eating these whole foods, right? Well, <laughs> ne next to it, I think, uh, yeah, black beans and a sweet potato. Like that's a great, great, uh, with some feta cheese on it. That's mm. an amazing little snack that, uh, will probably make you nice and healthy. <laughs> this is great. I'm right. hungry now. Like, can we end this soon? Yeah. We only have a couple more left. Uh, <laughs> one that's really good for Nate. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're going to make me cry. Oh, is what? this a good one or a bad one? No cry. It's a good one. Well, it will be good. Uh, we're going to dig in the emotional graveyard of our trauma together. <laughs> what do the three of you recommend for a broken heart? Okay, I'm going to go cry. Chad, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard one. I don't want to minimize the importance of this. It's easy to mock this and joke about it, but when you're in the throes of it, it's a brutal place to be. Um, it, there's the romantic side of things and there's the loss of something or someone important to you. I, I'm going to stick the romance side for now. It, 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 it's, it's a tough one because even in that you have so many scenarios. Are you the person that initiated the breakup? Are you the person that got dumped? Was it... <laughs> So they say mutual, which it never is, by the way. It, it, all, all I can say is uh, distraction and, and, and positive distraction. It, it sounds uh, – it's what you'd expect me to say, right? Go ride your bike. But for real, it, it can be a very cathartic experience, a little bit of physical activity, a little bit of distraction, something that allows you to think but not necessarily dwell and ruminate. Uh, I, I can't get any more specific than that. Chad, level Ivy? one – Emotional intelligence coach. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a great point. Um, ruminating in the heartbreak um, can only be so uh, productive or destructive either way, right? Um, and I just love this question. I love that an athlete wanted to hear our perspective on this. That's so cool. Um, but I think uh, if we're talking about romantic side of broken heart, Going to therapy is scary and really hard for most people to speak very candidly to a stranger um, and honestly in a, yeah, really clear way about what went down in a relationship or in a life event or life trauma is really hard to do with someone you don't know. Um, and so you're leaning on your support system and people you know and love that might be, you know, some degree removed from the situation that fe you feel like you can receive their honesty or criticism or feedback with a, without getting defensive, um, or complicating your relationship with them. That's what has helped me a lot. Okay. Nate. I'll go. Number no, one. No time. cry. <laughs> no cry. Time's going to be the thing. I mean, <laughs> It sounds cliche, but that is the number one stuff. That's real. Uh, number two is um, depending on the uh, the person, and I'll talk more about this in a second, but like a no contact rule is important for those people who get drugged back in and then they kind of have it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And there can be certain type of relationship dynamics that's going to be really hard. And um, you might not have a reason and you, you think you need closure. You're never going to get closure. Like it's, it's just the way it is. And uh, it can be extremely hard or getting things like – you know, if you don't want to unfollow them from social media, muting them. In certain cases, you have to block people because they'll keep trying to pull you back in. Um, another one is understanding. Um, this doesn't help you so much in the middle, but this will help. Um, like when you're when you're in it, this stuff's hard. But afterwards or before, this does help. Is understanding attachment theory. There's a really famous book called Attached, which I think is actually not a very good 
description of attachment theory. Um, there's an audiobook called uh, Your Brain on Love by Totkin. That's the best. I mean, that's a really good way to describe attachment theory. And he uses different words rather than anxious, secure, um, avoidant, and uh, fearful avoidant. But that is a, a wonderful book, and I highly recommend it for anyone in a relationship. And I'll go over attachment theory really quickly. But basically, there's there's four types. There's anxious, secure, avoidant, and fearful avoidant. And anxious is that one where you're in a relationship and you're like texting someone and you're afraid, like you keep rewriting the text. You seek security over and over again in the relationship. And you almost have like emotional impermanence where like if you don't see that person in a few days, you're like, oh, do they still like me? Do they still like me? You don't feel secure with that person. And you might also do this thing called protest behavior where you you cause little fights to bring the person back in. And you might see this from another side. And this is from parents who denied your emotions as a kid who said, oh, just be a man. That doesn't really hurt. Uh, you know, I'll give you something to cry about. Um, and people get this kind of way. They're often empaths and can be really good at like um, looking at small facial features and like changes in somebody's face, um, which can be hard in a relationship because you see someone make a slight change. You think it's about you because you had that with your parents and then you get anxious and be like, what's wrong? Is there something wrong? Um, secure is what we all strive for. It's about half the population. You're good. Um, you can be talked to, you can go to your partner, anxious people also, I'm going to go way into this. Sorry. So just <laughs> fast forward. If you don't like this, <laughs> anxious people also want to, when they are feeling high in stress, they want to go to their partner. Um, secure people are secure. They can be by themselves. They can be with people. It's amazing. Avoiding people are ones that pull away. And when they get times of stress or somebody really likes them, they go Uck, and they go away. They want to be alone. And they'll oftentimes in relationships, if they get angry, they're like, they just go away and say, I'm going to talk to you two days later. And it can be really hard for that anxious person. Um, avoiding people had it where maybe they had a parent die or the parents annoyed them as a kid or not annoyed them, uh, ignored them as a kid. And they got really good at self, um, self soothing and being with themselves and being alone. And what happens is, let me get to my point here, anxious and avoiding people, they get into a relationship together. And it's a very common pattern where the anxious person chases the avoiding person and the, the avoiding person at first feels really good, but the anxious person like chases a little more and the avoiding person pulls away. And what happens to the anxious person is they almost feel like they are, can keep be addicted. And they're kind of reliving stuff that happened with their parents. And if you have a heartbreak in this, the avoidant person might leave for no reason. And it's because they're scared to get close to you. And for you, you're like, oh my gosh, what is happening? You don't know, you want answers and they run away. And then you chase them more and they run away more. And that can be such a hard heartbreak. There's one more that we can do a whole other podcast about fearful avoidant. You're both anxious and avoidant. It's called disorganized. Those are like, maybe your parents were sometimes loving, sometimes not. Um, they were alcoholic or something like that. And one other thing that can be hard, this gets thrown a lot around a lot, but if you're a people pleaser and you're with a narcissist, um, a narcissist can, they'll keep pulling you back in afterwards and they don't want to see you happy. And they'll just send the right, they'll send pictures of like, don't you remember this after they broke up with you to pull you back? Um, they'll do every excuse in the world. And those are those people you got to do no contact and not talk to them anymore. Um, I, so those are some therapy, like you said, uh, is also amazing. Yeah. Name. There's my little attachment theory. Read that book though, or listen to that book. It's, it's really good. It's like a lecture. Um, I've listened to it with partners before and, uh, it's, it's beneficial. Yeah. It's really cool that you've done this work and could share this and chat. I'm super great that grateful that you shared too, because all of our listeners think of you as kind of, uh, oh. I don't know. Tough, stoic. tough guy. Stoic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have secret, secret heart of gold. And so it's cool to hear you share and people totally, I've received criticism, um, as our community mm. manager for when we talk to, about feelings too much, but you know what, <laughs> this is the podcast dedicated to making you a better cyclist and healthy, happy, balanced people that care for themselves are better cyclists. You know what to avoid in people, they start talking about uh, feelings and they get actually feel really uncomfortable and they don't like it. And it's very uh, common for men because we get, you know, we're not supposed to have feelings. Like this is how we're, we're kind of grown up and we can kind of be ignored when we do express feelings or punished even um, that it's not a, uh, a masculine trait to have feelings and which is not the case. And uh, yeah. So if, if you do think that a hey, talking about feelings, this is horrible. Why would anyone do this? Maybe, maybe look internal and figure out why you feel that way. We'll talk to you about your feelings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. We got to end with a fun one. 
Uh, last one here. <laughs> Should cyclists shave their legs? <laughs> Chad Timmerman. Hundred <clears throat> percent. Everybody should shave their legs because yeah. legs are disgusting. <laughs> it's just, it's just true. It doesn't matter if you're well, a cyclist if you have really or not. Really small calves. <laughs> really small. <laughs> like you're a French yeah. bulldog. There, there's honestly, we've joked about this enough times. There's not really a good reason. If you're going to get a lot of massages or do a lot of self massage or body work, that's probably the best reason. Every other reason just doesn't stand up. Uh, um, I have a good reason. Yeah. Uh, when was the last time you have had? Uh, road rash on a really like dirty gritty road or yeah. that and you have hairy for me like I uh, don't fully shave but just like trim my arm hair now because mm. the number of times I've had to either buy an EMT or by myself try to scrub with hairy yes. arms like yep. really gritty stuff and it's getting caught in your arm hair and it's pulling on your arm hair it sucks horrible there's a that was always my number reason. one no, for sure. That was always my number one reason, but I have to weigh that against how often I crash. Now, of course, I'm going to crash because <laughs> I've crashed in a good long time. So if you don't crash much, then that's not a very good reason. So th th that's that's the argument against it. But just, yes, yeah, so hairy legs are gross. I mean, that's that's 100% all you. the time Thank thing. Thank you. <laughs> they are not gross. So, uh, the human body is beautiful in its natural state, Mr. Timmerman. Uh, if Air Dynamics, though, that does play, if you're a very hairy person, five to 10 watts is not unreasonable of drag. So if you want to race oh. and you care about it, but okay. if not, and you just want to ride, I mean, two, do you ever, <laughs> there could be an ego thing too, about being hairy legged rider and dropping people's shaped legs. Uh, that's totally, like totally bag, baggy clothes, yep. hairy riders. You're yep. like, ah, oh, just whatever. Hate those guys. I just picked my bike up <laughs> yesterday and they <laughs> drop you. Yep. <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a real thing. Um, so yeah, it's no shame. We're we're I find I can't positive. take myself as seriously it, it, as, as a bike rider if I look down and I have hairy legs. So there's obviously some some deep psychological underpinnings with me, but. <laughs> Chad. Yeah, as we talk, that's the next therapy session. We'll talk about why Chad <laughs> views hair as disgusting. His head is shaved. His, 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 his legs are shaved. Um, Chad, I have something serious to talk to you about. Okay. These questions were amazing, correct? Yeah, I was... Maybe you're going to beat me to the punch, or maybe I'm now going to beat you to the punch. I obviously pick the questions all the time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and I think maybe host, like, next time. Like, it's going to be bad with me, Ivy. I've done it once. It was not good. And this was really, really good. So uh, we can talk about this offline. We don't keep you on the spot here. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe we do a vote on uh, Instagram of who is the better Oh, who no. should we host next. <laughs> <laughs> not who's the better host, but who should host next. We, Ivy, mm -hmm. you're going to win. Obviously, Thank we're color you. people. Yeah, this was. We'd like to respond. Yeah, this is great. Good job. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for your honesty. This has been awesome. Thanks to all our athletes for the great hot take questions. This was amazing. Um, if you haven't followed us on YouTube or given us likes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts, make sure to do so. What else? Like and subscribe. Thanks for joining us, y'all. Thanks, bye -bye, everybody. everyone. <laughs>